is just to say, okay, yes, free the states. We, we do have a mission statement. I just want to start with the mission statement, and it will explain why we're involved in Senate Bill 13, the rally tomorrow, and the work that we're doing. Um, and that is, our mission is to, uh, it's kind of nerdy, assert state sovereignty to abolish abortion state by state. For those of y'all who are like, right on, because you know what state sovereignty is, you know what asserting things are, and you know what abolishing abortion is. We're trying to free as many states as possible from their participation in the American abortion holocaust. And hopefully we'll move on from America to the rest of the globe. So that's what Free the States is, and we are abolitionists, we're a state sovereign organization, but we're an abolitionist organization, so of course we're here about Senate Bill 13, the Abolition of Abortion in Oklahoma Act. But I want to start out with this. We are not a pro-life organization. Woo! The reason we're not a pro-life organization, we're going to get into it. It's a lot of what my talk is about. And that is just because we're not a part of the pro-life establishment. For those of y'all who've been trying to like support Senate Bill 13 and do stuff, are you running into pro-choicers saying, no, 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 I don't think it's time? No, you're running into pro-lifers. We're not a part of the pro-life political establishment, the Republican establishment, that sort of thing. We are abolitionists, an abolitionist organization. We're part of the abolitionist movement. But what, so what's all that about? When I say we're an abolitionist thing, the abolition of abortion act and all this kind of stuff, all the people that are wise with labels and rhetoric and all this kind of stuff, back when we started doing this five, six years ago, they're like, you can't use the A word. You can't use the A word. People don't know what that means. And whenever you say it, they'll be like, oh, you're talking about slavery? I thought slavery was about abolished. Well, actually, I think today when you say abolition, I think people think slavery and abortion. As if you guys are doing such a good job. But most of the time, whenever I get on the phone, like with the Tulsa world or someone like that, and I say I'm an abolitionist, they go, you know, what? Doesn't that have something to do with slavery, right? Abolition, slavery. As Josh's song, Oh Holy Night, there's a verse about abortion, there's a verse about slavery. It's just about ending oppression, right? But everyone thinks about slavery. But as an abolitionist organization, we are abolitionists. And while everyone thinks of Thomas Clarkson, William Wilberforce, right, Lee, Harriet Tubman is going to be on the future $20 bill, guys like William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, if we look at these earlier Christians, who were fighting a particular evil in their day and time, did they confine abolitionism to just slavery? Or did they believe that every age has its evils and every age would have its abolitionists? That's what they believed because they were adherents of abolitionism. What is that? Abolitionism, Thomas Clarkson, sorry if I'm moving fast, Thomas Clarkson, the first historian of the abolitionist movement in Britain, who wrote The Rise, Progress, and Accomplishment of the Abolition of the Slave Trade Act. Um, yes, it was a bestseller at the time, short, pithy title. Um, he wrote, he was very active in the cause, um, part of recruiting Wilberforce and that sort of thing, but he wrote that he just wanted to define it pretty simple. It's just the removal of evils. And in his work, he actually said, Moving a little fast, he actually said, the reason I'm writing these volumes, there's two big volumes, and says, because there will be future evils and future Christians who have to rise up and fight those evils, so I want to leave behind what we did, what worked, what didn't work, what was good, what was bad, so that they too can remove evils in their culture. So the removal of evils, not just slavery. Of course, everyone knows who William Wilberforce is, thanks to popularizers like Eric Taxis and that movie Amazing Grace. But, you know, you, we all know about him, and I'm not going to go back over the story because we're not time, but it's not apocryphal. After they abolished the slave trade in Britain, they come up to William Wilberforce, everyone's clapping and cheering, and he's, you know, and they're all like, good job, good job, you know, yeah, now you can take a break. Yeah, what are you going to go do now? Wilberforce was like, I'm going to go to Disneyland. <laughs> he said, what do we abolish next? Well, if it's about slavery, what do we abolish next? Because there are more evils. This is what Christian, uh, Christianity is about. It's what Christians do as salt and light. So it's the endeavor to remove evils, very simply put. But it's an ism, so it's an ideology, so we have to get a little bit ner more nerdy. If we want to dig deep into it. The most famous abolitionist at the height of the abolition of the slave trade in Britain wrote a book. 
I don't have it memorized, I have to read it. A practical view of the prevailing religious system of professed Christians in the higher and middle classes in the country contrasted with real Christianity. <laughs> By William Wilberforce Esquire, right? And there's actually verses and stuff below. But what is this book? When Chuck Colson kind of translated the English and put it out a decade or so ago, he just called it real Christianity or practical Christianity. And the thesis of this book, you would think, here's the great abolitionist of slavery. What's the thesis of this book? It's that when we compare biblical Christianity and what Christians are exhorted to do in the word of God to what Christians are doing today, we find that they are inconsistent. When we look at all the evils in our world today, and we wonder, how are they this way? Well, when we look at the church and we see what they're doing, it explains it. So he's going to contrast this fake Christianity with real Christianity. So the key for abolition was not writing a book about, look, science says that slavery is wrong. The key was not that. The key was to get real Christianity, a revival of true, practical Christianity, and bring it into conflict with the evil of slavery. So abolitionism there for William Wilberforce, and I, instead of calling it real Christianity, or I like to call it contrasting Christianity. Christianity in conflict with the culture of death, the culture of slavery, bondage. That's where abolitionism comes from. It's also a major thesis of pretty much every writer from this period that I've read. So, um, so when you read this stuff, he says that Christians refuse to go with the rest of the culture to do or allow evil. They rise up and they abolish it. That's what they do. Now, of course, William Wilberforce, we all think of him as well-liked, right? He was probably well-liked. Him and his friends, their Facebook, they, they never got messages. No one ever slandered them. No, they actually all kind of like lived together in this little uh, town outside of London, and they were called a sect because the word cult hadn't trended yet. <laughs> right? The Clapham sect. But they all lived in Clapham and they thought that Christians ought to be changing the culture. And all of the other Christians who were like, just no, Christians are supposed to be like the culture and go to church on Sunday. You guys are a cult. So you've got Wilberforce, and of course Wilberforce does an excellent job leading the parliamentary campaign against the um, slave trade, but there's still slavery going on in the British colonies and around the world, and so the abolitionist movement has to continue after he's sort of old and retired. Um, the lady in the middle, I'd love to talk more about her, but it's Elizabeth Hyrick. She began to criticize the then abolitionist movement for sort of losing steam or getting off and saying that, you know, no, we need to refuse to go to the multitude to do evils. And she wrote pamphlets and led campaigns to continue the work because while Britain was abolishing the slave trade, there was this thing that happened called the War of Independence. And um, after they had gotten rid of the slave trade and slavery and that sort of thing, well, we were no longer a colony and we had had it continue. So of course the impulse and the spirit of abolitionism had to come across the pond to our land where it was picked up most famously, infamously, by a young Baptist named William Lloyd Garrison. And he is the first one to sort of literally define abolitionism is refusing to go with the multitude to do or allow great evils. Garrison, <laughs> it's funny. Garrison, um, great guy, he's been very slandered. Um, but if you read all of his works and his letters and all this kind of stuff, he's just a student of the word of God, dripping with the, the prophets. I would say they were like, well, let's just say, William Lloyd Garrison is a plagiarist, the greatest plagiarist on the planet in the history of the world. Everyone thought he was brilliant, that he, he had this prophetic tongue and he knew how to condemn the evils in the culture and call out for justice and stuff, but really all he was doing was ripping off the Bible. And the people had become sort of, uh, uh, I guess, biblically illiterate enough, so because he would define abolitionism as you shall not follow the masses in doing evil, um, nor shall you testify in the dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order for a justice. Exodus 23, 2, conveniently not cited. Um, actually, back in the day, people were biblically literate. I'm kind of joking with y'all, but people were biblically literate enough that you could stand up and use the scriptures 
And you didn't have to worry about those people who were seeing if you're a Christian by putting the parenthetical address on there because they knew that you were speaking the word of God. So he said that abolitionism was refusing to go with the multitude to do evil. And so he would stand up in public. He was not well liked. They mocked him. They wanted to tar and feather him. An abolitionist movement um, arose in the 30s around him, and he was not the only one. He's just the one that I've studied the most. But he would stand up and say that the nation is full of the blood of innocent men, women, and babies, full of adultery and concupiscence, full of blasphemy, darkness, woeful rebellion against God, full of wounds, bruises, and putrefying sores. And everyone's like, convicted. Well, rightly so, because he stole that from the prophet Isaiah. <laughs> Sinful, if you look at Isaiah chapter 1, there it is. Sinful nation, laden, evildoers, nothing but wounds, bruises, and putrefied sores. They're not bound up. They're not. So... So what it is, is in America, you had, in the midst of this slavery that was going on, in their culture of bondage, their culture of death, you had Christians standing up, speaking the prophetic word of God to their culture, saying you must repent. This is abolitionism. Abolitionism is Isaiah 1, 16 through 17, isn't it? Wash yourselves, start with you. Make yourself clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's cause. It's the word of God. The prophet that Jesus quoted the most. Isaiah, first chapter. Correct oppression. Seek justice. For who? The fatherless. And the widow. The abandoned woman. The abandoned child. We'll get to it. So that is the core of abolitionism. All right? So we got, we got Garrison. He's not alone. I, I love to, I'd love to keep you here all night long and go through 15, 20 other figures. But maybe even more well-known than Garrison, of course, is Frederick Douglass. Very close friends. Kind of have differences on some things, but very um, a lot of camaraderie, at least in regard to using the word of God to convict the culture that they were living in and to, set, to tell them in the, in the words and the language of Isaiah that your hands are full of blood. Here is the 4th of July speech famous from Douglas where he is actually saying, God does not hear the prayers of American parishioners calling them to repent. Of course, without going too much into it, the liberator, William Lloyd Garrison's uh, he started in the 30s and it ran through the end of the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment. Uh, um, and these guys were unashamed of this, that they were, they were fighting for the abolition of slavery, but they were saying that the standard which Christ has erected is the one that they revere. It's the divine authority of the scriptures, that their trust is in God and their aim is to walk in his footsteps. My rejoicing is to be crucified to the world and the world to me, my fanaticism. Because they were called fanatics, they were called cultists, they were called everything. They were called heretics. And they said, my heresy is to love my neighbor as myself, to love God with all my heart, soul, and mind. My fanaticism is to make Christianity the enemy of all that is sinful. And my infidelity is to preach Christ and him crucified. So, contrasted Christianity. Christianity, enemy of all that is sinful. Now, the secondary literature... And that's for the non-nerds in the office. That's people today writing about people back then. Um, without getting into too much historiography and revisionism and all that kind of stuff. The church leaders, the political leaders, the people in power at the time were all basically either on the side of slavery or on the side of tolerating slavery. It was just a necessary evil. And so they spent a lot of time writing the first books on the abolitionists, dogging them for being heretics. And of course, the heresy was that they believed that uh, slavery was a sin. But now when we go back and we look at all their letters, all their correspondence, their journals, their personal journals, published remarks and stuff, um, it is overwhelmingly agreed that the attack on slavery was formulated in religious terms. From first to last, it was practicing Christians who provided leadership for the cause. You'll hear sometimes that those abolitionists were heretics. That's just because they weren't like the rest of the church people in tolerating slavery. But they weren't heretics. They were bringing the cause of Christ, love of neighbor, love of God, into conflict with human bondage. And the main difference that these heretics had with the 
accepted non-heretical Christians was they called chattel slavery sin. Always and everywhere and only a sin. Chattel slavery. This is their declaration. This is what got them in trouble. So why do they call it sin? Because there's slavery in the Bible. There's slavery in cultures. Why do they call chattel slavery sin? Well, the idea was that it was all predicated on man stealing, which in the Bible is a capital crime. We'll get to it. But it was treating human beings, image bearers, men and brothers, sisters, like cattle, like property, measuring them up, buying and selling them. It destroyed the family. It written, these are redrawings of old drawings, but I didn't change them in I just had to redraw them. Um, but they, they, so these are the, the propaganda they produced. Ripping families apart, taking children from their mothers, taking wives from husbands, husbands from wives. It just destroyed the family, it dehumanized man. It was violent, it was wicked, it was abhorrent. So of course, as the slave is pleading, like the least of these, those being oppressed in their culture are pleading to God, help us. The abolitionists are the Christians in that culture who refuse to be silent and to go along with the multitude to do evil. Of course, in the midst of this culture, it's a very religious culture, and the church and the state, I don't know if you can see these little drawings, were continuing on opposite the abolitionists who were bringing their Christianity into conflict with the evil of slavery. The rest of the world was going along with it. Um, Brian Green, he was an abolitionist professor, uh, minister, and, he, and he, had, he had said, I cannot escape the conviction that our Savior has presented to us this very case of our colored brethren in the 25th of Matthew, the 25th of Matthew, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Whatever you did for them, you did for me. And that we cannot plead ignorance. If you look at that passage from Christ, he's saying that there's going to be people gathered up at the end of time and those who say, Lord, Lord, we did all these great things in your name. Look at our churches, look at our publications, look at our ministries, look how many Facebook likes we have, etc., 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 in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me, I did not know you. What? But we, Lord, Lord, whatever you did not do for the least of these. Brian Green, in the position of power and authority at a university, he lost that job. Stood up for abolitionism whenever the anti slavery moderates of his day said that he could not. He said, I have to. Cited Matthew 25, was removed. Um, John McKibbigan, just before we move on, this is another secondary source. He points out, and this is very clear to anyone who studied the movement, that when the abolitionists rose, as Mary Turner said in hers, it was from within the church, it was the people of God, it was Christians, but the first thing they tried to do was convert the churches to the cause of immediate emancipation. We'll get into that, but they were trying to convert the causes, the cause to immediate instead of what the church was doing, which was gradual. Um, but that's just to say, John McKibbing, and this is the source, is saying that that was the goal and work of the abolitionists. How did the church respond? We zoom in here on the paper. Attention, Southern men, town with abolition. Meet it. The Presbyterian Church, 7 o'clock. <laughs> Wait, so, so down with abolition, meet at the church. We're going to get our, our, our bully clubs together, and we're going to go throw their stuff in the Mississippi and beat them. Let's meet at the church, and let's get that going. But the, abolition are her the abolitionists are here just to, to, to disrupting things. Now, the abolitionists were never anywhere near as disruptive as the slanderer said, but Jesus said that they would go about slandering him. Hard to recover. But yes, it's a true, I didn't just make that up, that's a true pamphlet that was distributed, and there are many, many of them. Um, this is a very religious culture. Most everyone considers themselves a Christian, but they think that this idea that slavery is a sin comes from Satan himself. This is a caricature of Mr. William Lloyd Garrison and a very much caricature of a brother who is uh, not white, um, and the devil saying slavery is to sin. And at the bottom, abolitionism has divided the Methodist Episcopalian church. So these are bad people dividing the church. What are they dividing the church with? Calling the Christians to bring their Christianity into conflict with the evil slavery. Won't go into it, but uh, persecution ran up, um, amok. So this is, just to conclude on these abolitionists before we move on to, to more present 
stop anything that appears that is that sorry I'll read it <laughs> it appears to us a self-evident truth that whatever the gospel is designed to destroy at any period of the world being contrary to it ought now to be abandoned if the gospel is contrary to it it ought to be abandoned it ought to be abolished Garrison towards the end of his work of course Jesus would be the central figure in the abolitionist movement separating the slave from the slave master as was sung in the song okay so they saw slavery as this evil that had to be chopped down and all these other evils that came from it and it had they had to take their axe to the root what they had to deal with and as we transition is this problem in their culture there were people who were not into Isaiah 1 16 through 17 ism but into Isaiah 10 1 through 2 ism those who decreed iniquitous decrees who wrote laws that undergirded oppression, that robbed the needy and the just, uh, justice of the poor, that made the widows their spoil and the fatherless prey. So Isaiah stands up and he condemns those who are writing laws, iniquitous decrees, that look good, because these are all Christian religious people are, at this time. They're all Hebrew. These are the, the, the false prophets of the Hebrew and the um, the cultures of that time who would say peace peace when there's no peace and say that they were writing laws in, in accordance with the word of God but they were actually making the fatherless pray and justifying child sacrifice okay. so from, whether you're talking about the law of God or the prophets of God and it's pretty much in every prophet you study the root of abolitionism is this call for justice and this refusal to just go along with evil so of course what happens by the um, mid 19th century is this charge or this unifying cause is no compromise with slavery. No compromise. It is evil. It is sin. It must be abolished. It must be abandoned. No compromise. Everyone else is compromising. We shall not compromise. Another plagiarist. His was no compromise with segregation. During the civil rights movement, they were putting their bus rallies and all their things together and they're doing stuff. The moderate pastors and political figures who were against mistreating, they wanted equal rights, were always telling him, can we just get a little? How about you're just allowed to like sit in the front of the bus if you want? He's like, no, I want voting, I want this, I want this, I want this, I don't want to like have my own bathroom, I want, I want equal rights, right? No compromise with segregation. It's an uncompromising thing, and of course, King, for all his problems, would still source it in Christianity. All right, so you're thinking, all right, what does all of this slavery stuff have to do with abortion? Y'all are a smart crowd, so you probably already know this, but let's think about it. Slavery and abortion. So you came to an abolitionist movement party, this is a party, and um, and someone said, you went to an abolitionist movement, is it? Well, uh, Slavery and abortion aren't the same thing. Don't go, yes they are, because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying every age has its evils. Yeah. Every age has its abolitionists. Abolitionists then and abolitionists now are the same, bringing contrast to Christianity and the conflict of evil. But slavery was a dehumanizing, racist, evil um, practice that, that dehumanized and destroyed people. Abortion is not like slavery. It's not as racist, it could be, people will say that all the time, but it's ageist, it's blatant ageism, right? It's dehumanizing. It no long, slavery didn't treat people as made in the image of God and dominated them. Abortion doesn't treat people as made in the image of God and dominates them. They are the same categorically, but they're different evils. So of course, they are completely inconsistent with Christianity, and they're predicated on the dehumanization and domination of man. They're both practiced, and this is important, under the covering of unjust laws and decrees, that Isaiah 10, 1 through 2 ism, that's what they are. There's all sorts of laws in our culture that protected slavery. Here's how you do slavery, right? From the Constitution all the way up through the 13th Amendment, unjust laws and decrees practicing slavery, and unjust laws and decrees pra um, protecting abortion. When people say, I read in the paper, on the, not, not on the way here, because I want you to think I read in the car. <laughs> I made a live video. 
But, um, but what, 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 what I read before getting in the car was like, it was a quote from Joseph Silk. It was like, I think that, you know, abortion is murder and it should be abolished, some kind of good quote like that, and, you know, it's not constitutional. And then it was like, supporters of the bill are like wanting this to happen, but okay. opponents say it's not constitutional. Mommy, I, I need to help. Well, guess what they also said was constitutional? Slavery. They amended the Constitution. They don't have to amend the Constitution to get rid of abortion, but slavery and abortion both go under the name of constitutionality, and they have the protection of all three branches of our government. Slavery, all three branches, that entire time. Judicial, executive, legislative, protecting slavery. Right now, abortion. Judicial, executive, legislative. People thought in the 19th century that slavery, there are different approaches to fighting slavery. People today, there are different approaches to fighting abortion. Another similarity. So, back in the 19th century, anti-slavery, you had gradualists, and you had abolitionists. Um, so back in the day, and this is standard historiography, there were multiple groups fighting slavery, and historians kind of continue to break them up in all sorts of different ways, but there's two main groups. There are gradualist anti-slavery people, and there are abolitionists. The gradualists, they believe that slavery is wrong, and that it should be gradually abolished, right? It's wrong, we gotta get rid of it, but we can't get rid of it too quick because the economy, who's gonna take care of these slaves? You don't want your white daughters, they'd say these things. But it had to be abolished gradually. You can't do it overnight, right? Gradual emancipation should also be voluntary, it should be compensated. We should be encouraging the slaveholders to choose life, I mean, to choose to let their slaves go free, and they should be compensated for their loss financially. We should actually pass some bills to make sure that whenever they voluntarily emancipate or manumit their slaves, they would be compensated. This is what gradualists prefer. They also focused on, these are the ideological preferments, but they focused on amelioration and colonization. Amelioration is just a fancy word for like assisting and taking care of slaves in their time of trouble, making it easier. Colonization is deporting them. Free them, because slavery's wrong, but send them back to Africa. Now these, a lot of these people are not Africans. They're second, third generation Americans. But, get them out, right? Racism. But the focus in the meantime was on ameliorating the slaves' plight, deporting them, and gradually abolishing slavery. The abolitionists, on the other hand, they stood up and said slavery is sin. It ought to be immediately abolished. It, it should not be gradually emancipation. It should be immediate emancipation. And it should be compulsory and uncompensated. You should not get paid for letting your slaves go. You should be punished for owning them and forced not to own them. And if we're not going to punish you because it wasn't against the law, we're not going to compensate you. And their focus, while they did practice amelioration, the abolitionists were the ones working the Underground Railroad, breaking the law to do that. But they focused on establishing justice, but in the meantime, they did help slaves to freedom in defiance of federal law, in defiance of the Supreme Court, in defiance of the judiciary, in defiance of their legislation, legislative branch. So, they said slavery is criminal. It should be prohibited by law. We started late, so I'm running late. But every American city, citizen who retains a human being in voluntary bondage is a man-stealer. And that, because slavery is a crime, the slaves ought to instantly be set free and brought under the protection of law. Man-stealing is a capital crime. In this culture, that means you got killed for it. They would say this, and they would say, like Josh said, hey, I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. Repent, go and sin no more. But that's, that's what the Word of God says. It's a capital crime. So the gradualists and the abolitionists were very different. I would argue that the abolitionists were the only one who were actually anti-slavery. The gradualists, um, because they would actually say gradualism is wrong, uh, they regarded it as delusive, cruel, dangerous, that it was a scheme which pretended to help slaves, but was just a substitute for immediate and total abolition of slavery. All this gradualism pretended to help, but it was substitute. And so they, they said it was delusive. 
So they were anti-slavery, the abolitionists. The gradualists were anti-abolition. They oppose the people calling for abolition. But they're known as anti-slavery. Maybe you're picking up what I'm putting down. <laughs> William Lee Miller, this is a modern historian, and he tracks this period. And this is about the 1830s. This is from The War Against Slavery. Big old award winning book that you all have already read. Um, and he's talking about the 1830s that a significant number, this is 1830s, this is not the 1780s, right? A significant number of Americans underwent a kind of moral conversion. The new moral perception was not only that slavery was wrong, many had been saying that for years, but that its wrongness had the highest priority, and that the way its wrongness had been opposed heretofore had been profoundly inadequate. And so the essence which these potential martyrs went out was not only to abolish slavery, but it was actually the immediate end of the sin of slavery and also the rejection of the American Colonization Society. So what's the American Colonization Society? It's that culture's pro-life movement. James McPherson won the Pulitzer Prize in this category uh, about a decade or so ago. He actually, he says, we've got to do this for people. People are kind of confused. We're going to call abolitionists ones, the people who agitated for the immediate, unconditional, and total abolition of slavery in the United States before the Civil War. Those are abolitionists. Everybody else, not abolitionists. So that's the historiography. So abolitionists, they said, never call evil good and good evil. Isaiah. Never do any evil that good may come. Isaiah. Never compromise with evil. That's the abolitionists. Don't call, it, don't call evil good. Don't call good evil. Don't compromise with evil. The gradualists said, listen, slavery isn't sin, and the abolitionists are evil. And they said that we must allow slavery for a time in order to accomplish gradual, peaceful emancipation. So they, we have to allow a little evil to get some good. And they didn't say never compromise with evil. They said compromise is key. That's how we get things done in this country. Compromise. So slavery is wrong. Slavery is criminal. All right, anti-abortion, real quick to conclude before we move on to the next song, because you love it. We don't call them gradualists anymore. We call them incrementalists. Gradualist sounds really bad. If you watch the Amazing Grace movie, uh, where William, Lloyd, or William uh, Wilberforce, the British one, he, he's, he's, he's fighting for the abolition of the slave trade, and uh, Dundas, the representative from Liverpool, or what, no, not Liverpool, don't quote me, stands up and he says, I agree with William Wilberforce that slavery should be abolished. And they're all like, and Wilberforce is like, at least in the movie. He's like, oh, this is great. And then he goes, but it must be done gradually. Remember that? Gradualism is a dirty word because of this period and because of the segregation period. So pro-lifers call themselves incrementalists. Euphemism for gradualism. Abortion is wrong. They focus on incrementally banning it. Eventual abolition. I agree with you guys that abortion should be abolished. Greg Tree agrees. Right? I agree. But right now, <clears throat> can't do it. We've got to help people choose life. Voluntary emancipation. Voluntary. Right? And we've got to like, help them. Compensation. Assistance. Adoption is good to occur. That's not the answer. The focus is on assistance and, assistance and adoption in the meantime. Now, of course, abolitionists today are saying abortion is criminal. I don't know if you've read SB 13. Abortion is homicide. Abortion is criminal. It should be prohibited by law. Immediate abolition. It should be immediate. It should be total. It should be compulsory and uncompensated, right? We're not talking about getting abortionists new jobs. Like, and then there were none. We're not getting abortionists new jobs. We're saying that the job that they're doing is murder, and they should be thrown in jail. So if we pass the law and they do it, we'll put them in and then quickly, yeah. Yeah. and then the focus, even though we can, we can do assistance and adoption, the focus is on establishing justice. In the meantime, you can go rescue those being taken away to death at the abortion clinics. You can engage people in schools and churches, wherever you are, to try to cut down the number of abortions. But your focus isn't on cutting down the number. Your focus is on establishing justice and loving your neighbors yourself. So abortion is criminal. Incrementalism is wrong. We are actually anti-abortion, right? 
The Tulsa world's like, well, I, I, she's like, I don't get it. I don't get what you're saying to me. Aren't you all anti-abortion? I'm like, well, if we're all anti-abortion, why am I saying support SB 13 and that person saying I'm not going to, but I'm pro-life? Because you're not actually anti-abortion. In your actions, you are anti-abolition. Following it? So incrementalist and abolitionist, and here's the thing. William Lee, William Lee Miller said this about the 1830s. I would rewrite it about the 2000s, but a significant number of Americans have undergone a kind of moral conversion. And the new moral perception is not only that abortion is wrong, many have been saying that for years, but that its wrongness has the highest priority, and that the way its wrongness has been opposed, and I'm not going to say here before in my version, previously, has been profoundly inadequate. Not only is abortion wrong, but the way it's been being taught is wrong. And that's what we've been doing. And the essence of which we're going out is to bring the gospel and contrast to Christianity into conflict with the evil. And we are saying today, never call evil good and good evil. Never do an evil that good may come. And never compromise with evil. Our opponents, abortion isn't murder. Tony Lowinger. The leading political lobbyist for the pro-life lobby in Oklahoma. I don't know if you've seen him. It's like me and Rusty and Lindy. They're in the hallway talking, well, he's abortion murder. Well, it's killing. If your mother had an abortion. Yeah, it's murder. And if you talk to the pro-lifers, who do they think are evil? And they say, we must allow abortion for a time and for various reasons all along the way to eventual abolition. They say this all the time. You can't just abolish it all. You gotta allow it a little bit along the way to eventual <laughs> abolition. Who's gonna take care of these kids? We don't have the infrastructure. We're gonna get in trouble with the federal government. Yeah, and they never give you an actual timeline, but they always tell you, it's on the future. But I agree with your goal, and how we're gonna get there? Compromise. Compromise is key. And we're saying no compromise. So abolitionists, we refuse to go with the multitude to do or allow great evils. I put these guys in black and white. I love this slide. I'll make it pretty next time. But from William Wilberforce through Martin Luther King to Dan Fisher and his campaign for governor to Joseph Silk and his work for SB 13, they are refusing to go with the multitude to do or allow any great evils. Not because they are pro-life, but because they are abolitionists.